All right, church. Good morning. What a glorious day to praise the Lord.
Thank you, band. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here on this little bit rainy day, but that's okay. Uh, we are people of baptism, and we welcome God's refreshing and cleansing waters. Welcome to all of you who are uh, with us via live stream, and those of you who are joining our worship uh, after we are done, we are glad for everyone who worships with us. Let us join now in saying our litany found on the screen. This is the litany we're using for the season of Epiphany. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. O come, let us worship the Lord, for God has done wondrous things. And let us sing another song.
Everyone's awake now. <laughs> Let us join together now in the Gloria Day Statement of Faith. We believe that the way we treat one another is the fullest expression of how we live out our faith. We find our approach to God through the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, who is our model for living. And we recognize the faithfulness of other paths, which may also lead people to an experience of God. We stand in God's grace, and we live that grace in our actions and attitudes toward one another. We understand the church as a community of people who together make up the body of Christ. As we strive to serve the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others, we are inclusive as Christ was and welcome all people seeking a closer relationship with God. We believe that the questions are as important as the answers, that living the mystery is a more sacred position than church tradition and doctrine. And we strive to love all, serve all, in Jesus' name, as we proclaim our mystery of faith, that Christ died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Congregation may be seated, and I invite the children to come up for the children's message. So, what was your favorite day this past week? Was it the snow day? Because I have no idea. You have no idea. What was your favorite day? The school when my dad came to my school to, to do computers. Oh, your dad came to your school to do computers? On Friday. Oh, Friday. Cool. Cool, yeah computers in school and dad in school too excellent nothing 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 how was how was the snow day for now, everyone now I came up with something. okay do tell where, where my my friend had a crush on another kid uh-huh and, and I and my best friend told me uh-huh okay that's always fun yes what else Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to pass these out. So take whatever you would like of these. We have the, the these also. And so now, if you have if you have more than one, please pass to people who don't have any. Okay. So you, so you have two. Could you share? No, those, those are hard to share. Okay. Well, I will take this one apart because this one is cold. Yeah. Ho, ho, ho. That one's on backwards anyway. It bothered me. Okay. So you all have different measuring things, right? What shall we make? Mm -hmm. Pancakes, uh, ice cream. Ice cream? Cake. Okay, I think pancakes. Pancakes. Pie. pie. Ice cream. Ice cream. Well, we can't make ice cream, but we can make pie pancakes. or pancakes. pancakes. What do we need to start? Mm hmm. Right, stuff that you can make it with. For instance, flour. How much flour do you think we're going to need? Uh, Hold up if you three, if you if you're if you teaspoons. three teaspoons of flour. Okay. Two cups. Two cups. Two cups. Who has who has a cup measurement? Okay. Yeah, this is one half cup. All right. Three and four. 
how about salt? Just need a little bit. How much salt should we put in? Mm -hmm. A teaspoon. A teaspoon? Okay. Does anyone have a teaspoon? Show, hold up your teaspoon. Okay, there's a teaspoon. Now, why don't we use that much salt? Hold that up. What's funny about that? That's so much. That's so much. What would it taste like if we had that much salt? Salty. It would taste salty. Yeah. Yeah. Too yucky. Too yucky. It would taste too yucky. So when we measure something, we have to be really careful with it, right? One time I made something and I put in salt instead of sugar. And I kept tasting it, and I would add a little bit more, but it wasn't tasting any better. It was tasting worse. And I thought, what is wrong with it? I've been, I've been adding quite a bit of sugar. Uh-oh. And then it was salt. So it's really good to measure. But some things you really can't measure. Like ice cream. Well, yes. Yes. And didn't I just open myself up for that? As an ice cream maker, that is why you like the idea of ice cream. Then why will you measure a human? Yes, why will you measure a human? How do we measure? What's the best measure thing to measure? Tape. Mm -hmm. Measuring tape. Mm -hmm. uh, a sandwich. A sandwich. I have an idea. If we were to measure forgiveness, how much would you want to have? A million. Would you want to have a little bit? A lot. So here's, here's one that's... One quarter teaspoon. Do you want Do you want this much forgiveness? No. How much forgiveness do you want? This much? Okay, a tablespoon of forgiveness. How much forgiveness do you want? Um, a whole church of forgiveness. Yes, a whole church of forgiveness. That's what we need. And do we have that? We do. We do. All right. Well, let us pray. Oh, loving God, we give you thanks for all your many gifts, for your gifts of pancakes and pie and ice cream, but especially we thank you for your gifts of forgiveness, especially the forgiveness we know in this whole church. Amen. All right, thank you so much. And let's... Let's actually put them all in that big one. Enjoy Sunday school. Before you spoke it to me, you were the king of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join the mass, we sing. Glory, glory to, to God. God, glory to God, glory to God. Me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of a king. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God.
today we're going to be looking at Joseph but I wanted to give you a little background first so that you understand uh, the import of today's text. Joseph was one of the sons of Jacob. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great patriarchs uh, in the book of Genesis. Jacob had 12 sons the 12 would later become the 12 tribes of Israel. But his favorite son was Joseph. Joseph was the 11th of the 12 sons. And he gave Joseph a wonderful coat, coat of many colors. And Joseph um, was a little arrogant, shall we say or a lot arrogant. He also had dreams, and in the dreams, there were 11 bowing down to his one. And he actually told his brothers about this dream. And uh, the older brothers were not pleased. And he had another dream, and he told them about that one too, and they were really not pleased. Well, one day they were all with the sheep, and Joseph came upon them, and they said, this little creep, let's kill him. But they decided not to kill him. Instead, they took his robe off of him, threw him in a pit, and when a caravan came by, a trader's caravan came by, heading toward Egypt, they pulled him out and they sold him. They human trafficked him. And then they took his torn coat, put a little goat blood on it, and showed it to their father, Jacob. Is this your son Joseph's robe? They knew it was. And Jacob said, yes, my son must have died by a wild animal. And the brothers knew better, but they didn't say anything. They allowed their father, Jacob, to think that his favorite son had died a violent death. And so he wouldn't go look for Joseph. Joseph went through a lot of trials in Egypt. He was a slave, he was in prison, but he had this gift of interpreting dreams. He wound up interpreting Pharaoh's dream, which was seven fat cows being consumed by seven skinny cows. 
and Joseph rightly interpreted the dream to mean that there would be seven years of plenty of wonderful harvests, but they would be followed by seven years of famine. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I want you in charge of getting together all the extra food in the years of plenty and then distributing it in the years of famine, in the years of want. And so Joseph became Pharaoh's number two. And Jacob, back in Israel, had heard of the food that there was in Egypt, so he sent his, he sent the ten oldest sons there to negotiate for food. And they meet Joseph, but they don't know it's Joseph until this very moment. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. God has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry up and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son, Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And Joseph kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading for today is a continuation of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Plain. He's speaking to his disciples as well as the crowd that had gathered there. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. 
but love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For the Lord is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put in your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Here ends the reading. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I like to watch cooking shows. I get new ideas of flavor combinations and techniques. At first, my husband was really not thrilled that I was watching all these cooking shows. But then he noticed that my cooking had gone up a step or two. So now he thinks it's a fine idea. One of my favorite shows is the Great British Baking Show. It is a competition uh, among amateur bakers in Great Britain. And uh, there is, there are, each week there are three baking challenges. And at the end of each show, one baker is eliminated. And at the end of the season, yes, at the end of the season, the one is chosen star baker for the season. And there is a lot of pressure on these bakers. They have to have excellent techniques in mixing, in proofing, in baking. You see them looking into the window of their ovens. Is it brown enough? Is it brown enough? Sometimes the mixture is not working to such an extent that they have to throw it out. They just open the trash can and dump it in there even after 40 minutes. Just, and they start over. Measuring, precise measuring, that is one of the secrets. Now, I'm not a good enough baker or a good enough judge of baking, or well-known enough to be the judge on the great British, British baking show, but there are lots of times when I really wish I'd been there and gotten a few tastes. Eating is good. Certainly when the famine hit Jacob and his family, they realized they better go and get something to eat. And so they went. Jacob sent his ten oldest sons, the same sons, who had sold their brother into slavery to Egypt. Now they had to go to Egypt. Fifteen years had passed. How many of those days do you suppose they wondered what happened to their brother? Was he still alive after all those years of slavery? What a horrible life he must have had. What guilt they must have felt whenever they were around their father. Whenever they heard the word Egypt, 
whenever they saw a, a trading caravan pass by, even if it wasn't going in the same direction. So they went to Egypt looking for food, looking for something to eat. And they are met by an Egyptian, dressed like an Egyptian, shaved like an Egyptian, obviously well-fed, this man that they came to see. They don't recognize their brother Joseph, but he recognizes them. And when he finally reveals to them who he is, Of course, they are shocked. Of course, they feel that guilt. But Joseph forgives them. Joseph says, God had a purpose. God sent me here so that many lives would be saved. Your lives the lives of your descendants, as well as all these people in Egypt who would have perished. This image that I've chosen, I chose it because it really looks luscious, doesn't it? You know, this uh, kind of cream pie, and I imagine that Joseph's forgiveness was like that, luscious and sweet. But on top of this piece of pie is a needle of sugar. I actually got to see um, one of the bakers do this on the Great British Baking Show. Uh, he did about 12 of them, and uh, like here, he put it on the top of his cake for decoration. But it reminds me that however sweet forgiveness is, it's because there's been something sharp. There's been something hurtful that came. Joseph really suffered as a slave. He really suffered in prison. His forgiveness was not cheap. The forgiveness that he offered to his brothers was not for nothing. What was their just desserts for human trafficking him, for lying to their father, When people today are convicted of human trafficking, what happens to them? Prison. Yeah, you're in prison. Those older brothers did not get their just desserts. Instead, they got forgiveness. One thing about Joseph and his forgiveness. Joseph forgives his brothers here in chapter 45 of Genesis. Joseph forgives them again in chapter 50 of Genesis. I think that's so interesting, and it certainly is like my experience of forgiveness. I know I have forgiven my great uncle Chuck. I have forgiven my brother Kevin for what they did 30 years ago and nine years ago, but every once in a while, that anger comes back. And I know I need to forgive again. And Joseph, whom I regard as the greatest forgiver in the Old Testament. Joseph had to forgive his brothers again. And so I think 
Sometimes I do, too. When Jesus gathered his disciples in the crowds, he told them basically what Joseph lived out with his brothers. He told them, love your enemies. Be good to those who have hurt you. Forgive those who have harmed you. Joseph did all of that. Jesus said, if you love those who love you, big deal. That don't impress me much. Everyone, anyone can do that. I call you to something bigger. I call you to love those who intend to do you harm. Love those who don't have your best intentions at heart. Do to others as you would have others do to you. We call that the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, some people can even make that golden rule into a law that comes back and gets you. I'm going to share a portion of a poem by Howard Nemiroff called Manners. Prig offered Pig the first chance at dessert. So Pig reached out and speared the bigger part. Now that, cried Prig, is extremely rude of you. Pig, with his mouth full, said, why? What would you do? Prig said, I would have taken the littler part. Pig said, stop fetching then, it's what you've got. <laughs> now, obviously, Prig and Pig have a lot of problems, only one of which would be solved by precisely measuring each part of the dessert. But Jesus holds up a different measuring system. If you give, if you love, if you forgive, you will get a good measure put in your lap, an abundant measure. It'll be pressed down. Some of it will be pressed down like we have to press down brown sugar when we're cooking, right? Press down the brown sugar. And then you combine it with the other agreements, uh, ingredients, they will be shaken up and then running over onto your lap. You will have so much sweetness, so much goodness. God's measurements are far from precise. God relishes abundance for us, abundant forgiveness. For all of us who have done so little to deserve it. What are our just desserts? To be held accountable. To have the finger pointed at us. And yet God does not. God provides. God gives us forgiveness. May we all experience such desserts this week. And may we pass them out as well. Amen. At this point in our worship, it is our time to pray for the needs that 
everyone wants to live up, live, lift up, and I invite you to share uh, your concerns uh, now. Just a reminder for those of you in the sanctuary, this is being live streamed, so if you bring up uh, someone's name or their uh, particular concern, you might want to only use a first name uh, or be a little vague out of uh, consideration for a person who may not want everything publicized. That the volunteers return home safely from Sudan. Someone. Neighbor Doris, whose husband died a few days ago. Alyssa and her family. Uh, Gunner, whose father uh, died suddenly, age 54. Mike, who suffered a stroke, age 60, not quite 60. Jack and Jan and Walter and Mary uh, with a lot of health issues. Human trafficking. I would like to lift up also uh, the people of Venezuela who um, are dealing with shortages of food and medicines and um, there is so much uh, trouble with the army and the police uh, restricting um, food and medicines coming across the border. Uh, joy, the of right. Uh, joy at the ordination of uh, Lindsay uh, Buchelman, who was uh, on staff here. Uh, Pastor Karen uh, I uh, preached at her ordination yesterday, and I imagine today that Lindsay is uh, standing up in front of her congregation uh, for the first time as ordained pastor, so wonderful. For our nation, that we would all have wisdom. Yes, for Pastor Tricia and her family, uh, her husband had a stroke uh, almost, not quite two weeks ago. All right, let us, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you are the one who provides for us, who gives us all we need. We are bold to ask for your healing power to be poured out on so many people. Those who have suffered strokes, those who are going through various kinds of treatments, those recovering from surgery. We pray for your healing power on those with mental and emotional illnesses, that they may know your hope and care. Gracious God, we pray for all those who are victims, for those whose bodies and labor are not their own, but have been sold and used without their consent. Gracious God, we pray for those who find themselves in desolate living conditions, for those without food, for those who are subject to 
dreadful weather that so many are experiencing. Gracious God, we are bold to ask for your qualities of wisdom and kindness and forgiveness to be poured out on us to go beyond filling this church to filling your whole world. For Lord, we so need it. Help us to know and to share your love and your care in all that we say, in all that we do, in all that we think. For all these things and for all we need, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now in our worship, we give back to God from all of our financial gifts in thanks for what God has done for us. Oh, 
I invite you to uh, look in your bulletin at the calendar of events coming up this week. Uh, you can still sign up for the family movie night on Saturday. And we have a lot of other announcements on the back of the bulletin. A couple of announcements that did not make the bulletin. Ash Wednesday is coming up. March 3rd, so it is a week from this coming Wednesday, we will be having worship services at noon and at 7 p.m. in the chapel. Uh, and I believe Pastor Karen and I are thinking about going to Beth Ayer's train station and giving out um, ashes uh, there also. So, but that is, um, Ash Wednesday is coming up the start of Lent. Also coming up uh, in March, March 17th and 24th, the transition team, the team that's helping Gloria Day uh, figure out what qualities we need in the next called pastor here. We will be uh, putting together really brief events. Uh, since you're the 930 service, you could come a little early on the 17th and the 24th from 9 to 9.30 in the Christian Fellowship Hall downstairs, or you can stay after for a while from 10.30 to 11 here. The uh, events will be different, but we'll be um, hearing from you and, uh, and uh, sharing things with you uh, about different ac aspects of leadership and expectations that Gloria Day has for its pastors. A reminder, this is the last Sunday in February. Uh, we could still use more of the uh, intent to give cards. We hope to get 175. And uh, those of you who were at the uh, Tell Your Gloria Day Story event heard John Hagman get up in front of everyone and say that he was going to increase his giving by 10%, and he challenged everyone else to. So if you give, say, $30 a week now, that would be $33. Or if you give $200 a week, it would be $220. The rest of you can do your own math. So, and there's a box in the back to put these in. Any, any other announcements for the good of the ministry of Gloria Day? All right. Well, we have prayed. We have heard God's word. We have sung a lot. We have shared the news of what God intends for us as we go out and leave this place. So all that's left is our sending song and a blessing. Please stand. Love, I know it's true. It's my 
much sweet forgiveness that it overwhelms all the sharp hurts. Amen. <laughs>